Welcome to the virtual worship service of Washington Street United Methodist Church, a church with heart in the heart of the city of Columbia, South Carolina. Before we begin worship, I have a couple of wonderful announcements to make today. Uh, first, our longtime member John Holliday was awarded the Order of the Palmetto recently, so we want to congratulate John and his wife Laura for such a wonderful accomplishment. And um, also, Mac and Wall, the daughter of Tom and Jane Wall, uh, has been named our new director of youth ministries here at Washington Street. So we welcome you, Mackin, and can't wait to start working with you. And now our call to worship by our businessman uh, administrator, Robbie Douglas, and his wife, Lisa. Good morning, Washington Street. I'm Lisa Douglas, here with my husband, Robbie. This morning, we'd like to share with you a scripture reading from the 16th chapter of Matthew, verses 15 and 16. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Just as Peter made his historic confession of faith, so we must each decide who we believe Jesus is. May we all recognize him as the Holy Messiah. And now let us light our candle. Let us worship the Lord. And now, if you would join me in today's opening prayer, let us pray. O oh God of mercy, help us to live a life which is fully alive and pleasing to you, a holy and living sacrifice. Call us away from conforming to the world's ways of selfishness, greed, and power. Transform our hearts, thoughts, and actions so they align with your perfect will that affirms and loves all people and all of creation. Help us to recognize and put an end to all the oppression and evil of this world and work to bring about your kingdom now. Open our eyes to see how we need each other and the unique gifts you have given each of us. Lord, transform us and use us to transform the world. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Son of God. Amen. 
The lesson today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because all he has done for you. Let them be a willing and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into the new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Here ends the reading of the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We all want to fit in, to be popular and well-liked. Back when I was in high school, I was really lanky and awkward, all arms and legs. I felt self-conscious and just wanted to not stick out. So I wore the clothes, listened to the music, and watched the TV shows that all the cool kids did because I wanted to be part of that group. I wanted to conform to be just like everyone else so that I wouldn't be seen as different. We all want to fit in and be accepted. That's natural. In seeking to do this, though, we get pulled along by what everyone else is doing. We end up being molded into the form that our culture demands. God's way, however, is different. God does not want us to go along with the crowd and blend in. Paul says it very clearly in Romans. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. The message translation of the Bible makes it even clearer. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, Fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. What does our culture say we should strive for? Money? Respect? Power? Notice all these things focus on self. They make life about me. What's in it for me? My money? My power? My respect? Is that what Jesus preached? No. He was a servant leader. He didn't draw others to him through fear or intimidation, but through love. He loved, served, and included the marginalized and the outcast. He was the servant king who lifted others up instead of using his power to push them down. Here in Romans, Paul is saying that our faith, our relationship in God, results in us being transformed people. We go from being inwardly focused on what's best for me to being God-focused, where we pay attention to what God wants, which is for us to love both God and all of God's children. How does God achieve this type of transformation in us. 
How does God get us to risk being different? So countercultural by having a relationship with us. God calls to us, seeking a relationship. Then, as we get to know God, we learn who God is and what God's about. We think, of, think about the disciples who lived with Jesus and traveled with him. They got to know God face to face. And that relationship changed them, each and every one of them. In Matthew, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter responds, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. This answer shows that Peter had gotten to know the Lord and had decided for himself that Jesus was the Messiah and Savior, the one to whom he owed his ultimate allegiance, the thing that should be most important in his life. This acknowledgement of who Jesus is, of what God means to us, is essential for each and every one of us to make. When we have a true relationship with God, we will know God personally. And we will live and act differently because of that relationship. We won't worry so much about conforming to the world around us because we are being transformed by the Holy Spirit into our best selves, the people God created us to be. In other words, when we have a relationship with God and we make a confession of faith, that confession, that faith, should act on us in a way that our beliefs are visible in our actions. Having a relationship with God causes us to be transformed because we recognize the love of God that is filling us up and we want to share that love with those all around us. And God's love will so fill us up that we can't help but spill it on all those around us. Now what should this transformation look like? There are lots of examples from scripture and as well as from more recent times. One example is found in the first chapter of Exodus in the story of Shipra and Pua, two Hebrew midwives. Now the story goes that there was a new king in Egypt, one who did not know Joseph. Now that's important because this king didn't realize why there were a bunch of Hebrews, a bunch of uh, immigrants living in his country. He was scared of these foreigners because they might not be loyal to his country. So he came up with a plan, a plan for genocide. He wanted to kill all the Hebrew baby boys. Uh, he decided that the best way to kill the boys was at birth, when they were weak and vulnerable children and their mothers had just been through labor and could not defend them. Pharaoh's plan seemed foolproof. He just needed some willing accomplices. So he called two Hebrew midwives, Shipra and Pua, and ordered them to kill the Hebrew baby boys at birth. It would, it would be difficult for Shipra and Pua to disobey Pharaoh. They were just two powerless immigrant women, uh, and he was the supreme ruler of the land. Not doing what he told them to could result in death. All of their circumstances pointed to conformity, to going along with Pharaoh's wishes. But Shipra and Pua had a relationship with God. Scripture says that they feared God, which didn't mean that they were afraid of God, but that they were awestruck by God's holiness and wanted to live their lives God's way. Their faith in God had changed them. They were transformed by this relationship with the Lord, so much so that they were willing to risk death by disobeying Pharaoh's orders. They would rather risk that death than to do something that would displease God. 
They saw the Hebrew baby boys not as a threat or a problem that needed to be solved, but as human beings created in the image of God and thus being sacred and having infinite worth. So they stood up to Pharaoh and did not carry out his immoral plan because they recognized that God, not Pharaoh, was their true leader. They didn't know how their act of civil disobedience, of protest, would turn out. Still, they were willing to stand up for what was right because they had been transformed by the love of God. They were willing to put their faith into action and miraculously, they got away with it. Just like Shipra and Pua, when we have a relationship with God, we will be transformed by our faith. We'll no longer be conformed to the world, to the ideals of this country, or anything earthly. But we will be transformed and want to follow God's will. This is the process that John Wesley called sanctification growing more like Jesus every day. When we have a true relationship with God, we will be willing to go against the grain and follow God's will to care for groups typically ignored, such as foster children, illegal immigrants, and the homeless population. We will respect everyone and seek equality for all because we are all equally beloved children of God. When we're willing to let God guide our lives, the Holy Spirit will transform us and will give us the courage to risk standing out from the crowd. We will not focus on what we want, but on what God wants. We will be willing to take an unpopular stand and point out where the culture is wrong because it diverges from God's way. I've been reading a book entitled Trouble I've Seen by Drew Hart. In this book, Hart recounts a story about Martin Luther King Jr. that I want to share. In 1954, Reverend King and his family moved to Montgomery, Alabama so he could become the pastor of Dexter Avenue um, Baptist Church. He was young and in a new position. When the, uh, later, when the Montgomery Improvement Association was formed in response to Rosa Parks' act of civil disobedience, Reverend King was appointed as its president and spokesperson. But he turned that position down. He just wanted to be a, a pastor, finish his dissertation, and grow his church. Later, however, he changed his mind and did accept this position and his vocal support of the civil rights movement made him a target for all types of intimidation, including death threats and burning crosses in his yard. The stress of this harassment tired him out and made him want to give up. However, late one night, after yet another threatening phone call, he sat at his kitchen table and had a talk with God. He recounted this conversation in his book, Stride Toward Freedom, The Montgomery Story, where he writes, In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God that midnight are still vivid in my memory. I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right but now I'm afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership, and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. At that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I have never experienced him before. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. Almost at once, my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared. I was ready to face anything. 
Reverend King let his faith in God transform him. He made it personal and active. He had a relationship with the Lord. So instead of conforming to the world's ideals, solid career, church growth, taking care of himself and his family, God transformed Reverend King into a leader of the civil rights movement who affected real change in this nation and unfortunately was assassinated for his activism. Believe it or not, we can all be like Shipra, Pua, and Reverend King. We can be in a relationship with God. We can have a true, authentic relationship with the divine. We can let the Holy Spirit, God in us, transform us from the inside out so that we become more like Jesus each and every day. As we become transformed to look more and more like Jesus, we will be willing to stand up and stand out for the things that are important to God. We will show our love for God and others by our actions. We will love everyone as God does. And when we do, the world will resemble the kingdom of God, where everyone is valued and treated equally, regardless of their skin tone, gender, sexual orientation, age, ability, or economic status. Sounds like heaven, doesn't it? And it is. But it starts small. It starts with a relationship with God. Thanks be to God. Thank you.
If you will join me in the prayer of confession, let us pray. Almighty God, we confess that we are often swept up in the tide of our generation. We have failed in our calling to be your holy people, a people set apart for your divine purpose. We live more in apathy born of fatalism than in passion born of hope. We are moved more by private ambition than by social justice. We dream more of privilege and benefits than of service and sacrifice. We try to speak in your name without relinquishing our glories, without nourishing our souls, without relying wholly on your grace. Help us to make room in our hearts and lives for you. Forgive us, revive us, and reshape us in your image. And now we join our voices with all the saints as we pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. beginning of a school year, uh, let us have a prayer for the blessing of teachers and students. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for creating us to learn and grow. As we start a new school year, many of us are apprehensive. School will be different this year because of COVID-19, and we ask for your protection. Lord, we pray for all the teachers who are being called to go back into the classroom. Please strengthen them, protect them, and give them the ingenuity, creativity, and flexibility to teach in person, virtually, or some combination of the two. 
Lord, we pray for the students who are resuming classes. Some of them will be going to school. Some of them will be learning virtually. Some will have switched schools and some will be homeschooled. Even with the changes they are going through, give these students the ability to focus, learn, and have fun. Lord, we pray for the parents who are faced with the difficult choices this year about what is best and safest for their families. Give them wisdom and discernment to make the right choice for their family and to understand that all families are different and there is no one right and perfect choice. Almighty God, we know that you are here with us. Please give our leaders wisdom and discernment to lead us according to your will and way and help us all make responsible choices so that this pandemic can be brought under control soon. In the precious and holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.